Hello, everybody. I'd like to bring our meeting to order. This is the Sacramento Environmental Commission. It's a Monday, April 17th. Uh, Jill, would you like to have a call to, uh, roll call, please? Yes, Robert ba Bailey. Mark Berry. Here. Dana Curran. Present. Dr. Anthony DeRigi. Here. Richard Hun. Here. Diane Kinderman. Here. George Buzz Link. Here. Margie Namba. Here. Eric Rivero Montez. Here. Mark White. Here. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Uh, because there are many people here in the audience today, I'd like to maybe go through a quick introduction of the commissioners. Uh, tell us who you are and who you're representing. Uh, Mark, can you start down there on your side of the table? I'll get my microphone on this time. Uh, hi, my name is Mark Berry. I represent the city of Sacramento. I am a, a land use and economics, my background, and I'm currently a transportation and policy planner for Caltrans. Hi, my name is Margie Namba. I work for Granite Construction. My background, I have a degree uh, from da UC Davis in biological science. I'm Buzz Link. I'm a county appointee, Sacramento County appointee. I'm a registered civil engineer, and my area of interest is water. Hi, my name is Dana Curran. I'm a program manager for General Dynamics, and my background is in environmental management and project engineering. I'm Richard Hunt, and I was appointed by Sacramento County, and I'm a consulting environmental planner. My name is Marie Wooden. I'm the interim director for Sacramento County Environmental Management Department, and also staff to the commission. Hello, my name is Eric Rivero Montes. I am a representative for the city of Elk Grove. I'm currently working at the Sacramento Municipal Utility District as an environmental specialist. Um, my background is in chemical engineering, and I'm primarily focusing on greenhouse gas and climate change issues. My name is Mark White. I represent uh, the county. We have a small firm that consults with the garbage industry. And I am Diane Kinderman. I'm a city of Sacramento appointee. I'm a shareholder in a law firm, the law firm of Abbott and Kinderman, and we practice environmental <laughs> land use and real estate law. I'm Tony DeRigi, I represent the city of Sacramento, and I'm a retired pediatrician with interest in environmental health. Great, thank you very much, folks. Um, we usually reserve an opportunity for receiving public comment. If anybody would like to approach the commission at this time and make a statement, uh, you're available to do so. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to item five of our agenda, which is the Sacramento Environmental Commission of Environmental Awards. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like uh, Eric Montez to uh, take over and uh, uh, make the presentations. Okay. Uh, tonight, the SEC recognizes citizens, businesses, or organizations based in Sacramento County that have demonstrated outstanding efforts to improve and steward the environment. We will be presenting four trophies to the winners of this year's environmental awards in no particular order. Our first winners are the City of Elk Grove Integrated Waste Department and Toby Johnson Middle School for an on-campus school recycling and education program at the middle school. The City of Elk Grove was con contacted by one of the school's teachers, Kathleen Albiani, to assist in the implementation of a school recycling program. Elk Grove staff worked to train and educate a core group of students and teachers about the logistics of recycling and correct sorting using signage and colorful printed materials that clearly showed which waste streams got sorted into the various bins provided by the city of Elk Grove. The on-campus recycling program also addresses the new requirements for organics recycling and the city provided food waste bins and educational signage. Each week, students collect and audit recyclables in classrooms to give, the custodi to, give to the custodians. This type of on-campus recycling program serves as a model for other schools in the Elk Grove School District that would like to incorporate on-campus recycle programs at their school. Accepting the awards is Christian Punsel, Integrated Waste Coordinator for the City of Elk Grove. Uh, from Toby Johnson Middle School, Kathleen Albiani, She's a teacher at Toby Johnson Middle School. And we have a gr group of students here that I'd like to recognize and acknowledge. Um, they're part of the um, school recycling team. Anthony Walker, Nathan Brown, Sidra Hussein, and Erilyn C.
to say anything to the commission? You're welcome to go ahead and say something. Good, e good evening, uh, Christian Punsal with the City of Elk Grove. On behalf of the City of Elk Grove, I'd like to thank the, the Commission for this recognition. About a year ago, as uh, you noted, uh, Toby Johnson Middle School approached us with this concern of not having a recycling program. So me scratching my head, thinking that that's a little unusual, we decided to visit this site. And it's true, half of the items that are in their trash could be recycled. So we assisted them. And then when the new school season started, we went out and it was just amazing to see these students go out every Friday visiting about 60 classrooms to recycle all their recyclable items. And what's also impressive is that starting next week, they will be the first school in the district to be recycling organic waste, which is the new state requirement that all businesses in any jurisdiction will have to follow. So as noted, they would be the model school for other schools in the district to follow. And it's very impressive that these students are able to, um, to pass that along um, to where they go. Again, thank you. Hello, I'm Kathleen Albiani. I'm a, a home ec teacher at, at Toby Johnson Middle School. And um, like I said, when I started uh, last year, I, I asked for my recycling bin. My classroom seemed to be missing the recycling bin. And, and I was told that there, there wasn't one. There wasn't actually recycling on campus. And I thought, well, that's odd in this day and age. And so I contacted Christian. And the city has been absolutely amazing at getting us everything we've needed. We got a round of bins for all the classroom. And when sorting became an issue, we got a whole nother round of bins that we labeled for cans and bottles. And um, the students have done a phenomenal job. It's it's completely student driven. I. Um, I'm the one that asked for the bins, but I have to say it's the students that you know sort the half-eaten pizza from the uh, cans and bottles, and that's not always a very fun job. But um, but they do it without complaint, and they and they're so um, they're just very gracious about the whole process. So thank you so much for recognizing um, our school and recognizing um, the city and our students. And um, I brought t two of them today, and thank uh, thank you to their families for for coming all this way. Um, this is Erilyn C. and Anthony Walker, and they've both been integral in really refining our recycling process. Wow, that's great. <laughs> um, we'd like to say thank you for helping us out and helping recycling. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, could I add just one comment? These guys are what takes the practice home to the families to do it. These guys are the ones who are going to keep doing it now for their whole life because they know how and they know it's not hard. And they're wonderful. Thank you. Our next winner is the Carm Carmichael Water District for their American River Pipeline Conveyance Project. The project was developed to provide a replacement water supply for Golden State Water's company, Golden State Water, customers in Gold River and parts of the city of Rancho Cordova. Utilizing existing treatment capacity at Carmichael Water District's CWD water treatment plant. The project enables CWD to divert and deliver up to 4.5 million gallons of water per day. The replacement water supply originates from the remediated Aerojet groundwater discharged to the American River at Buffalo Creek. The SEC commends the CWD for their efforts and commitment to water sustainability practices. As part of the American River Pipeline Conveyance Project, there was also extensive natural habitat restoration along the American River that I would like to highlight. The restoration included removal of exposed and abandoned river infrastructure. Abandoned water diversion assets at the project site along the American River were removed, and the riverbanks were restored to a natural setting. The environment restoration included the removal of 400 feet of 33-inch diameter exposed steel pipe dating back to the 1950s that had long posed a boating hazard in the river channel. 
In addition, three concrete intake and pump station structures, a fa failing riveted steel culvert, and a, and a large buried valves were demolished and removed. The restoration culminated with the re reconnection of an upstream riparian habitat that had long been separated from the primary American River Channel by a freefall discharge from a 65-year-old culvert. From, Car from Carmichael Water District, Carmichael, Carmichael Water District's general manager, Steve N Nugent, will be accepting the award from our board president, from our board president Mark Emerson. The following, the following people are also in attendance that we'd like to recognize. Paul Selsky, the Carmichael Water District Board of Directors. John Wallace, Carmichael Water, board, Water District Board of Directors. Lynette Moreno, Carmichael Water District Assistant General Manager. Paul Schubert, Golden State Water Company General Manager. Arthur Hinojosa, Department of Water Resources Chief of Division of Integrated Re Regional Water Management. And Alex Peterson, Kennedy Jenks Consultants Vice President. Michael Water District would like to thank the commission for the recognition for this award. A few times in your career you get to do a project like this that not only takes a resource that is impacted through groundwater contamination and treat it and then to deliver it to customers that need it, but also in this project we also got to restore part of the American River that Carmichael has always wanted to do. We've been a, a partner on the American River for a hundred years and we had infrastructure on the river and some of it was a hundred years old. And so removing that, seeing that facilities that were long since abandoned, removed, returning it to a natural setting was just a goal for the district we've always wanted to have. We made a commitment to the environmental community back in 1999 when we built our water treatment plant, we would come back and do this. And so we honored our commitment and we did it. And so we're very excited and very happy that it was done. Thank you very much. Our final trophy winner of the evening is Sacramento County's Department of Water Resources for their management of the collaborative Cordova Creek naturalization project. The purpose of the project was to replace a deteriorating concrete line channelized portion of Cordova Creek, formerly referred to as Clifton Drain, with a new meandering stream channel. The project was designed to create a naturalized channel intended to restore ecological function to the stream and also included measures to eradicate and prevent reestablishment of invasive species, installation of an, of an interpretive walkway for public recreation and environmental educational, education programs implemented by soil-borne farms, and establishment of over 19 acres of new native riparian wetland and upland habitat. The project was completed in the fall of 2016. The new stream channel has a natural stream substrate, a wide meandering design, and banks consistent with natural vegetation assemblage and historical drainage patterns. The project installed a total of approximately 4.3 acres of new riparian habitat, 4.8 acres of wetland habitat, and 10.1 acres of native upland plantings. Spe special provisions were taken all throughout the design and construction process to protect sensitive wildlife, plants, and other natural resources at the site with the intention of establishing a more productive and natural environment where these resources can thrive in perpetuity. To receive the award, Tom Go Goring and Lily Allen from the Water Forum, Sam Diaz with CBEC Engineering, Juliette Robinson, Sacramento County Planning Department, Environmental Review, and David Bolin, Sacramento County Department of Water Resources.
Hi, I'm David Bolin with Water Resources. Um, I'd like to thank the Commission for this award. Um, this has been a very um, rewarding project for me personally and for the department. Um, when you think of this project, this is a collaborative effort in every sense of the word. Um, in fact, I have was sure to write down all the groups involved with this. Um, the project started back in 2007, 2008, trying to get state grant award for the project. Um, first attempt, we were unsuccessful, took a second attempt, and finally we got the grant and were able to go to construction in 2015, 2016. So this has been a long effort, um, but very rewarding. So definitely would like to thank Regional Parks SAFCA, Water Forum, Seabeck Engineering, Planning Environmental Review Division, City of Rancho Cordova, Soil Born Farms, and the California Native Plant Society. Thank you. I'm Lily with the Water Forum, and I'm here for Tom. He's under the weather, and I'm recovering. And I want to say thank you and invite you personally to come to our ribbon cutting ceremony on May 21st. It's a Sunday, probably at about 10 a.m. Um, we're partnering with Soil Born Farms. It's their day on the farm as well. It'll be a really lovely event. So please join us in celebrating this creek. Hi, uh, Chris Bowles with Seabeck Eco Engineering. Uh, just wanted to add uh, our thanks to the Commission as well. And it's actually been about 13 years since a uh, few of us got a piece of paper, back of an envelope, and scratched down some ideas. And it's just built um, momentum over the last 13 years, and it's uh, wonderful to see it built now. So, yeah, even if you can't make the ribbon cutting, it makes a beautiful walk on a Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I think that concludes our awards presentation. I'd like to thank all the participants and uh, the people who uh, submitted um, applications for our, our awards. Uh, we encourage you to continue doing your work. It's great stuff. Maybe next year we'll see you again. And uh, one more time around, if there's any other comments, just give everybody an, an applause, please. Okay, um, our next agenda item is uh, Gary Goodman, who's the executive director of the Sacramento Yolo Mosquito and Vector Control District, is going to make a presentation to us. This has become an annual event, Gary. And yeah, I'm sorry about that. Really. <laughs> We're um, glad to see you back. It's yeah. uh, very always very informative. So, uh, Well, wonderful. Definitely appreciate the opportunity, and obviously leave it to mosquitoes to know how to clear a room. Um, <laughs> So uh, I was starting to get develop a complex, like maybe my repellent uh, scent was a little too strong over there on the side. So, um, so yeah, this is kind of our, our annual uh, pilgrimage, I guess, to the SEC to talk a little bit about what we anticipated with, uh, with mosquito control for this upcoming season, what we saw last year, um, some challenges that we're facing, obviously, with uh, the amount of rainfall that we've had uh, specifically this year is going to be a big challenge for us moving forward. Uh, and uh, and uh, we'll kind of get started, I guess, with with the presentation there, if the, or maybe not. Metro Cable, could you pull up Fight the Bite? So before we get started, I guess with that, um, yeah, with the rain, we're seeing quite a number of challenges, I think, um, uh, for us, uh, just because we're leaving from a number of years of a drought, and then, um, interesting to see, we're actually starting to look back 20 years ago as to what was happening with the last last uh, uh, rainfall, that major rainfall that we had with the flooding that happened back in 1998, and starting to look at our records to see what kind of impact we're going to see in this coming season, because we've been dealing with a drought for so many years, and we, we're not used to have seeing all of this water. So. Um, you know, again, what our mission is, is to try to provide uh, effective economical mosquito and vector control districts. Specifically, you know, we were formed back in 1946. Um, 
uh, with a joint resolution between Sacramento and Yolo County uh, to essentially try to protect public health. And at that time, it was really looking at malaria vectors and also looking at general nuisance in terms of uh, property values, those types of things. Now, you couldn't go outside uh, without being bitten by mosquitoes. Well, now, uh, over the last 20 years or so, our focus has really started to move from uh, what we would call abundance or nuisance of mosquitoes to disease transmission. Um, and we've seen a significant amount of disease starting to come into the United States. And, and starting to be mobile a little bit more around the world. But, but our goal specifically is to make sure that people can try to enjoy themselves outdoors without that risk of, of having to run inside for the sheer number of mosquitoes and, of course, disease transmission. So our district comprises both Sacramento and Yolo County. Our main office is down in Elk Grove. Uh, we also have a satellite office in Woodland uh, that covers Yolo County operations. And our, our geogra geography is quite diverse because we have a large population center here in Sacramento and then surrounded really by agriculture all around us, even Natomas. If you look at Natomas, you've got rice fields on the north side of Alberta and on the south side of Alberta, you have population. Uh, a lot of, quite a bit of uh, mosquito movement that happens there. But even going down into the Delta and the problems and issues that we have in terms of mosquito production down in the Delta. And then of course, Yolo County is significantly agriculture and it has these pockets of population. If you look at Woodland, if you look at Davis and Winters, uh, Knights Landing, there are pockets of population that is surrounded 100% by agriculture, which has a significant impact on both abundance and of course, disease transmission. So we break up our district into what we call zones and we have a technician specifically that's assigned to each one of those zones that looks around every day for mosquito breeding sites. And so um, they're looking to try to find uh, during the course of, of their day, trying to find mosquitoes in their aquatic or larval stage. And so the life cycle of a mosquito is number one, uh, only female mosquitoes bite. Uh, female mosquitoes are looking for the protein in your blood to be able to produce the eggs. They'll lay anywhere from 50 to 200 eggs at a time. Uh, they can lay eggs in anything just as small as a tablespoon of water or a bottle cap of water they can lay their eggs into. Uh, then they'll go through four larval stages uh, emerge, and then go into one uh, pupil stage and then emerge as an adult. So um, you can see kind of they tend to uh, set up and well, I'll point. Well, maybe I won't point. One of these is a pointer. Maybe not, there we go. Um, you can see that egg stage. It's working here, never mind. That egg stage, upper right hand corner, uh, they lay in what we call egg rafts. Um, and so that's about 200 eggs right there. Again, going through the full metamorphosis. Um, and our goal is to try to get them in their aquatic stage. And so some things, especially nowadays with the amount of water that's out there uh, in these agricultural areas, very easy for us to spot. You can see wetlands, you can see rice fields, you can see, you can drive by an empty field and you see flooding out there. We can see that. Those are very easy things for us to spot. We have natural sources here in terms of wetlands and the Yolo Bypass is a significant issue. It's, a, it's amazing to see the amount of water that's in the bypass right now. Haven't seen that in years and years, but those also produce a significant amount of mosquitoes. And then we have some general urban sources. So when you talk about some of the creek beds and things like that, that they were just working on and trying to divert those types of things, a lot of that is developing these small wetlands that are in urban areas. And that is a big issue and impact for us in terms of being able to mosquito production and trying to protect the people that are living right in and around those particular areas. But the biggest challenge that we have really is probably the general backyard sources. And especially with this type of rainfall, when you have rain that just happens for a day or two, all of these little cryptic things that are in everybody's backyard fills up with water. Um, and it, again, it doesn't take that much water to start to breed mosquitoes. And so um, we're starting to see quite a bit of challenge with what we call service requests or going to people's residences and trying to find these types of sources because now, after today's rain and tomorrow's rain, all of these things are going to fill up again. So I can go to your house last week, everything's fine, now it fills up with water. And if you're not there to dump these things out, then you're going to start producing mosquitoes in your yard that's going to then have an impact on uh, your neighborhood and the population. And again, a backyard swimming pool that's not being maintained, one of those green pools can literally produce millions of mosquitoes during the course of a season. And the mosquitoes don't just stay on that property, they fly, and so they have an impact on the entire neighborhood. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we have moving forward. So again, these kind of what we call urban wetlands. Um, so it looks nice. Uh, I mean, 
you know, it doesn't look nice. It's a, it's a horrible green looking pool, but produces a tremendous amount of mosquitoes. And one of the messages that we try to get out to people is call us. We'll take care of it from the perspective of it doesn't breed mosquitoes. We're not going to turn it blue. Uh, we're not pool service folks, but we'll put mosquito fish in there. We'll treat it and we'll monitor it to make sure it's not going to produce mosquitoes moving forward. Uh, but one thing that we find a challenge with is sometimes we, we get out to there to the homeowner specifically now in, in April and May. And then a couple months later they say, well, yeah, maybe I do want to <laughs> swim in it. And they'll start to throw chlorine in it because they want it to turn blue and then kills our fish. And then if they're not maintaining it again, then we have that problem again. So it tends to be kind of a moving target for us just from the perspective of we think we've got it under control, but then the homeowner does something different. All you have to do is call us and be more than happy to come check on it again. So we talk about specifically water management is key. If we can manage water, whether it be on a rice field or a wetland, um, irrigation ditches, property, or in your own backyard, then we can reduce the number of mosquitoes. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever be able to eliminate mosquitoes. Uh, they're, they're pretty crafty. Mother Nature is really smart. Uh, she figures out a way to, to, to work around things. But making sure that we're, we're doing the best that we can. And I think the last couple of years with the drought has been a real big um, boost for us in terms of water management. A lot of municipalities started to put water restrictions mm -hmm. on, only water during certain times of the day, make sure that that water's staying on the grass, it's not running off into the street, which then gets into the catch basins and storm drain systems, which is a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. And so we hope that that mindset continues uh, for people moving forward, even though we're officially out of the drought uh, by quite a bit, more than double. Um, but again, we always try to ask folks to check your yard once a week, make sure you're not breeding mosquitoes in your own property, especially after a recent rain. And so we try to do that by using using uh, the media, we'll send out press releases and post things on our social media to try to make sure that the message is getting out to the general public. So what diseases do mosquitoes carry? Um, so we talk a lot about West Nile virus. Again, it's the most prevalent uh, mosquito-borne disease in the United States. It's permanently established in our area. Initially started in 1999, found in New York City, um, and then within four years steadily made its way across the country. We started to have it in Southern California in 2003, and then started to see it in Northern California in 2004 and had significant outbreak, especially in Sacramento and Yolo County in 2005. It is not going to go away. We have it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just because the reservoir, uh, the host is actually uh, our birds, uh, corvids, jays, magpies, crows, which we have an abundance of here in, in the Central Valley. Uh, those are the carriers of the disease. The mosquitoes are just the vectors of it. So it bites an infected bird, picks it up, bites another bird, passes it on, and goes from there. So we're never going to get away from it. But uh, there are other diseases that obviously we're starting to get more and more of a concern. Dengue fever, malaria, chikungunya, uh, which some people think I make up, but that's an actual disease. Uh, Zika virus obviously has been in the news recently in the last couple of years and I'll talk a little bit about that and then actually this time of year's dog heartworm is a concern because uh, there's this particular species of mosquito um, there's about 3,500 different species of mosquitoes worldwide uh, not all mosquitoes transmit disease uh, some mosquitoes bite very specific things there's a particular mosquito in South America that only bites frogs so uh, you could be around it, but it's not going to bite you. It's only going to bite frogs. We don't have that mosquito here. Um, but in our area, we have about 20 different species of mosquitoes. One of them uh, is a, a very efficient vector of uh, dark heartworm. Um, and so at this time, those mosquito species breed and lay their eggs in tree holes. So you get those little small holes that are especially in all the valley oaks that we have here. You get this rain that comes through, fills it up. Those mosquitoes proliferate, and then you've got potential for dog heartworm. So if you have pets, make sure they have the appropriate medication to help avoid that, but that is a mosquito-borne disease. So specifically, obviously the concern for us is what we have is we have actual transmission um, to humans of West Nile virus on an annual basis. And so this is the one that we're most concerned with uh, moving forward. So um, it is a bird disease. Again, we have two species of mosquitoes that are very efficient vectors of that. Culex tarsalis, which breeds tend to, tends to breed in agricultural areas like our rice fields and wetlands. And those mosquitoes can fly anywhere from one to eight miles in an evening. So they can easily emerge in the Conaway, uh, which is uh, surrounded by rice and then uh, by, by night's end be in West Sacramento or even be in Sacramento. Uh, and then we have Culex pipiens, which is the mosquito on the right there. Uh, Culex pipiens is known as the house mosquito. It's kind of a plain brown mosquito, but um, tends to bite birds, which uh, for us essentially amplifies the virus because that mosquito bites a bird, picks up the virus from that bird, bites another bird, passes it on, but it is also opportunistic and it will bite mammals if need be. And it tends to be what we call the house mosquito. So it's around you and your house. So when you're out in the backyard doing your barbecue, those types of things, these are the mosquitoes that are going to be most prevalent that you're going to see. 
So again, um, it is a bird disease, uh, just vectored specifically by mosquitoes. And then of course, horses and humans tend to be the dead end host, what we call dead end host. So uh, a mosquito can't bite an infected person with West Nile virus and pick up the virus. There's not enough viremia um, in our systems. Or same thing with horses. Um, so they tend to be dead end hosts, but the birds are the ones that keep that cycle moving. So what are the general symptoms? So uh, for the most part, about one in five people that get West Nile virus are going to experience some level of symptom. Um, the other 80% or four out of five people, your body's going to try to fight it off and it's going to be successful. You'll never even know that you had West Nile. Um, so uh, typically, like, like, like any virus, your body wants to build up the antibodies, fight it off, and if your body's successful at that, you'll never even know you had the virus. But for one out of five people, you'll start to experience some level of symptom. And those symptoms tend to be the flu, flu-like symptoms. Um, Jill and I were talking earlier, she says everything starts with the flu. Everything starts with flu-like symptoms. Uh, nausea, body ache, you know, you just feel tired, all of those types of things. And that will take place anywhere from about five to ten days after you've been bitten. So the body, the, the, the virus has to kind of replicate in your system a little bit. Um, your viremia has to come up and your body has to try to figure out if it can fight it off or not. So five to ten days after you've been bitten by mosquitoes when you'll conceivably start to experience symptoms, you'll experience these types of symptoms, the headaches, all of those types of things. Um, and, uh, and then it, your body has to try to figure out whether you're going to recover or whether this is going to linger on for over and over time. And so a lot of people try to minimize what the impacts of West Nile virus are specifically. And um, I try to think of it at like the flu. So it's flu-like symptoms. So with the flu, you feel crummy for a couple days, then you, or you start to feel bad for a couple days, and you feel really bad for a couple days where you're in bed. And then for a couple days, you start to recover. And then, you know, within a week or so, you get better and you're back to work and everything's fine. Um, West Nile virus has been described like that worst part of the flu lasting for just a couple days if your body reacts to it or can last for weeks or even months on end. So it can be much more serious and much more debilitating uh, than people give it credit for. And so we want to make sure that people are aware of what those particular risks for. So if your symptoms start to continue for that length of time, then you start to put yourself into um, consideration or, or uh, the possibility of leading into meningitis or encephalitis or what we call neuroinvasive form of the disease. Um, and this one obviously um, is much more serious, requires hospitalization, um, can lead to paralysis, obviously can lead to death, um, blindness, all of those other factors start to come into play and what's now be becomes much more serious for that particular individual. So these are the number of cases that we've had um, over the past number of years. Um, again, you can see back in 2005 or 2004 was the introduction down in Southern California. 2005 has started to make its way up north and we had you know eight, around 800 cases, pre pretty significant from that perspective. Then we started to see quite a bit of fall off and we had some really nice years from 09 to 11 where we had less than 200 cases reported. And then over the last couple of years, we started to see those numbers climb again. And we're attributing that a little bit to the drought. So it's a bit counterintuitive, you would think that with the drought, because you'd have less, less water, you'd have less mosquitoes, but because West Nile is a bird disease, wherever you did have water, you had a congregation of both birds and mosquitoes in the same place and tended to amplify the virus. So we think that we saw significantly more cases. Uh, one thing I do want to try to highlight here is these are only the number of confirmed cases. So these are numbers where people went to the doctor, they got diagnosed, they had a blood test, it came back positive, and they were diagnosed with West Nile. A lot of people will never either go to the doctor, they'll suffer through the symptoms of West Nile and so they don't even know that they have it. Um, they may go to their doctor and their doctor, for the most part, because treatment is just supportive care, uh, they may not ever test for it. So there's a lot of people um, that, that would have it, went to their doctor, but it never gets tested for, so they don't know that they had it. Um, so those are the ones that go unreported. And so of these cases, about 70% of these cases that we have here reported, which is almost 6,000 cases, uh, so about 4,200 cases, are their neuroinvasive form of the disease. These are the ones that definitely get diagnosed because somebody's in the hospital for it. Um, and so CDC actually estimates that for every neuroinvasive form of the disease, you have another 30 to 70 cases that go unreported. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of people um, over the last 10 or so years that have had, West, had symptoms of West Nile virus and have gotten sick. So again, when somebody would look at this and say, well, there's only been 6,000 cases, those are only the confirmed cases, still has an impact on people's lives um, and what they do with their work and their families and all of those other things. So we want to make sure that people are aware of that. 
So we have some new threats to California, and I think I talked about this last year as well. We call them invasive species of mosquitoes. So these are mosquitoes that tend not to read the textbooks that realize that they're not supposed to be here in California, and they're making their way to California. Um, specifically, the Asian tiger mosquito, which is the Aedes albopictus, uh, and the yellow fever mosquito, Aedes aegypti. Now, from a mosquito standpoint, these are very attractive mosquitoes. They're very striking. They're black. They're white. They have these nice stripes. They're very pretty under a microscope, um, probably only for mosquito people. But, um, but for the most part, these are mosquito species that typically were um, established down in South America and Mexico and Central America and are starting to make their way up into California. They have pop uh, populations established in Arizona. We have a lot of populations established down in Southern California, San Diego, Los Angeles area, but even as close to us as Fresno and Madera and San Mateo, uh, which is not that far from us, really only a couple hours drive. Um, one of the issues associated with these particular mosquitoes is that they lay their eggs singularly. So I showed that other picture where it was laid in kind of in an egg raft. They, these lay their um, eggs singularly and their eggs can last for six months or more. So they can lay dormant for six months or more. And so the concern that we have is that you could have somebody down in Southern California in an area infested with these types of mosquitoes um, and they have their outdoor pots and everything else which is a perfect place where these mosquitoes would lay their eggs and then they decide to move to Sacramento and so they take all their stuff they put it in the U-Haul they bring it up here and then they plant their plants and they put water in it and then all of a sudden those mosquito eggs become active because the eggs can lay dormant for a significant period of time. Um, these mosquitoes tend not to fly very far. They only fly about 150 yards. Um, so they tend to stay around where people live. Uh, they're very aggressive day biters, uh, which is different than the other mosquito species that we have um, in our particular area. But the biggest concern that we have is these are mosquito species that are very efficient vectors of dengue, chikungunya, um, and Zika virus. And so if they get established in our area, then we have the possibility of having local transmission. So a little bit about chikungunya. Um uh, uh, originated in Tanzania. We've had a number of cases over the past couple of years. They had major outbreaks down in Central America um, and in the Caribbean where they had over a million documented cases of chikungunya. Chikungunya in its native language means bent over. So it's very similar to dengue. Dengue means break bone fever. So it feels like someone is breaking your bones. So very, very painful joint pain. Um, so chikungunya is very uh, close to that. And there's actually was actually local transmission of chikungunya in Florida um, just a couple of years ago. So again, these diseases diseases that we've never had before. Um, if you look at just the last 20 years, we've had outbreaks of, uh, uh, last year there was an outbreak of dengue in Hawaii. Um, you've had local transmission of chikungunya. You've had local transmission of dengue in Florida. You now have Zika virus where there was local transmission, and of course West Nile virus. So in the last 20 years, you've had four major diseases where we've had local transmission in the United States. And so again, this is something we didn't have really have to deal with a number of years ago, but the world has gotten smaller. Global travel people travel to these particular areas, they can bring these diseases back, and then of course if we have the right vectors. So Zika virus uh, was first discovered in the Zika forest of Uganda in 1947. Similarly, uh, the West Nile virus was found in Uganda in 1937, so Uganda is probably not the best place to go if you want to avoid tropical diseases. Um, it is transmitted again through these Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, um, and obviously the, the, the big concern that we have here is can be passed from mother to child um, and uh, leading to the birth defects, which is really what's getting a lot of the publicity uh, associated with Zika virus. But it's also confounding to mosquito control experts in general is because it can be transmitted sexually. Um, we've never seen a mosquito-borne disease being able to be transmitted sexually, so that adds another complicating factor associated with it. We've been joking that not only should we be handing out repellent, but handing out condoms. Uh, we're not going to quite go to that level, but, um, but again, that complicates things in terms of a level of transmission. So again, um, Zika was never really uh, that big of a concern on the global scale. You didn't really have that many outbreaks. You had some uh, outbreaks in, in, uh, in Yap, um, which is in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the islands, Micronesia, uh, until it hit really Brazil a couple of years ago. Um, and the symptoms are already very, very mild. So West Nile virus, we would consider to be a bit more of a serious disease. Zika was very mild. You had some flu-like symptoms, joint pain, red eyes, rash, fever, all of those types of things, but you tend to tend to recover within a week and it never led to any other complicating factors. It wasn't until they found this link associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome and then of course the microcephaly in, the, in, uh, in babies to where they were really looking a little bit more closely at what the impacts of Zika would be. So again, microcephaly is 
uh, literally means small head and essentially what happens is the virus goes into the brain of the baby and it doesn't allow the brain to develop and so therefore then the head doesn't develop as well um, and even ones even even babies that don't have what we call microcephaly that uh, if the mothers are pregnant with Zika are still showing neurological impacts to their life so um, leading to blindness or just developmental disorders to where you know they're really not going to need uh, lead a, a normal life and so they're going to need constant care and so we are starting to see a number of these actually there was a, a, a case uh, we had our first microcephaly case in California um, earlier this year uh, it was a travel associated case but uh, but you're starting to see that have an impact on the United States healthcare system um, and again this is you know significant in terms of the the care that these babies are going to need and of course the families and the mothers so what do we try to do to combat all of this so we look at what we call uh, integrated mosquito management measures uh, the first one is public education we do a number of community fairs community events neighborhood associations whatever it is if you invite us to come out we'll speak to your group because we want people to be aware of what the risks are associated with mosquitoes and how to avoid being bitten we also have a very active advertising program with television radio and our social media all of those types of things and making sure that we're trying to get the message out as best as we possibly can then we go into our surveillance program so we set traps throughout our district every day um, and we're collecting those traps um, on a daily basis and are monitoring the populations of mosquitoes to see if something is going higher or lower um, and of course then testing those mosquitoes to see if they're carrying the virus and then getting that education out to the people so that they're aware of in my neighborhood there's been a positive bird or there's been a positive mosquito sample that's been collected so that they can try to take appropriate measures then we have a biological control program uh, typically mostly mosquito fish we have 23 ponds at our facility down in Elk Grove we breed mosquito fish we plant about 4,000 pounds of fish that's about 3 million fish um, in Sacramento and Yolo County um, specifically on an annual basis that's a lot of fish um, giant garter snake habitat loves our fish uh, we don't like giant garter snakes as much um, but uh, but we plant those in rice fields we plant them in wetlands we plant them in irrigation ditches wherever they will they will work we'll plant them um, and so it's a very efficient uh, use usage to try to help reduce mosquito larvae in the water. Then we go through physical control. We have a, uh, some heavy equipment, dump truck and, and uh, backhoe at our facility and we work with landowners specifically on being able to manipulate their property to help facilitate water movement so that water's not backing up and they're not producing. So we, we work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, Nature Conservancy, uh, Consumers River Preserve, anybody that we may identify will go to the owner and try to say, hey, this would be great if you could clear this out. We'll be more than happy to offer some of our services to help in that so we want to be able to work with the landowners to try to just help again manage that water then we go to under our control por portion of it so again our technicians are geared on an annual or on a daily basis to go out in their zones look for larval sources and treat them accordingly uh, but when we do get adult mosquito control or when we do get adult mosquito populations that are exceeding numbers that we're normally used to um, and or we start to get virus activity then we'll do our adult mosquito control and anywhere from a backpack to a truck or ATV or the airplane which we have done in years past and so those are the components of our program so again I guess I probably ran through that the public information aspect uh, surveillance again with the number of traps that we have and looking at things under the scope uh, the fisheries program um, our physical control program um, and then our larval and adult mosquito control so in general we try to ask people to put on repellent um, we buy repellent packets uh, by the pallet we buy a ton of this stuff we want it to be used so if there are events out there we give it to anybody who wants it all they have to do is contact our district we'll be more than happy to deliver it or they can make arrangements to pick up uh, but just in general DEET tends to be the gold standard associated with repellents um, the higher percentage of DEET the longer lasting it will be so the less you need to reapply it um, but it just depends on what you're going to be doing if you're going to go camping for you know a week then you probably want a higher percentage of DEET because you're going to be exposed to mosquitoes for a significant amount of time if you're just going out to your garden for an hour or so then maybe you need a less percentage but there are also other effective uh, 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 repellents that are out there approved by CDC uh, picaridin oil of lemon eucalyptus and IR 3535 which sounds a little sketchy but is um, but another product that is very useful it just tend not to last as long as DEET does so you want to make sure that you're following the label directions and reapplying when you need to it's not just a I'll put it on in the morning and everything's good we try to treat repellent like uh, sunscreen um, you know back in the day people didn't want to apply sunscreen and then you started to see the dangers associated with uh, skin cancer and that type of thing uh, but it's not just to put it on one 
time and then you're good. You want to make sure that you're reapplying it and following the label directions associated with it. So what do we ask people to do? Which essentially we have what we call the seven Ds. Um, drain standing water. Make sure that you're not producing uh, mosquitoes on your own property, especially after these rain events, making sure that you're dumping any standing water in your backyard. Uh, dawn and dusk are times to avoid being outdoors. This is when mosquitoes are most active. This is when they're looking for that blood meal. Again, the females are the only ones that bite and they're looking for blood meal to try to make sure that they can lay their eggs and find something. So if you can avoid being out time, outside during those times, that'd be ideal. If you can't, dress in long sleeves and long pants. Make sure that your skin's not exposed. So they can't really bite through all of the layers of, of clothing that you have. So you have to go outside, make sure that you're wearing some loose fitting clothing um, to try to help keep you cool, protect yourself when uh, mosquitoes. Again, if you can't do that, put on a good repellent. Uh, call us if you need it, just give us a call. We'll deliver it to you. You can come to the office and, and pick it up if you have an event, whatever that may be. Uh, doors and screens should be in good working order. So again, in the summertime, we like to get this uh, the delta breeze to cool off the house, and so we tend to open up the, our doors and screens. Well, mosquitoes are really small, and what they're doing is they're picking up the carbon dioxide that you exhale. That's how they know where there is a host, right? So they know there's an animal or something that's breathing, and if they're looking for that blood meal, they're picking up that carbon dioxide. So make sure that your doors and screens are in good working order, because if you've got a small hole, mosquitoes will find it, and then they come in when you're not aware of it and bite you when you're not when you're not <coughs> expecting it. And then the last D is district personnel are here to help. Um, this is what we do. Uh, we want to know where there's an issue. If you know of somebody that has a bad pool, if you see standing water, if you're being bothered by mosquitoes at your house, call us. Uh, we typically, we have folks that are out in the field and sometimes they'll go out that same day. Um, if not, they're out the very next day to your house because we recognize the earlier we can take care of the problem, the better off we are, the better your neighbors off are, uh, the, the, the better we can take care uh, of the issue at hand. So give us a call. That's what we're here for. And you can get more information on our website at fightthebite.net um, or give our 800 number a call, 429-1022. And I think that's it for me. Excellent any questions? presentation, Gary. Very, very informative. Thank you. I should bring a cup of water. I get there a any parched. questions? Any questions talk from fast. the commissioners? Marjorie, would you like to start? Thank you very much for your presentation. I always look forward to hearing from you folks. Um, I had a question. So with the West Nile, do you... Can somebody develop antibodies so that they're kind of immune? Um, typically, with, a, with, with a, a general virus, if, if your body builds up that antibody and knows how to fight it off, then, then yes, we haven't shown that somebody can get reinfected with West Nile. So once your body kind of figures out um, how to fight it off, then, then, then it knows that. So we, we, there, there has been some work done. And again, you know, if you think about it, there's not a lot of work done on West Nile virus before 1999 because it didn't get to the United States. A lot of times it takes a disease to come to the U.S. before we really start studying it a little bit more. Um, so we really only had, you know, 20 years or less than 20 years now of study about the impacts of West Nile virus in long term. So typically if your body fights it off, it's going to know how to fight it off. So if you were to get bitten by another infected mosquito, but, you know, your body also, your immune system weakens over time as well. And so um, it really just has an impact. We, they're starting to show links um, with uh, uh, symptoms of West Nile or you're more susceptible to exhibiting symptoms with West Nile virus if you're a diabetic. Um, why that link is specifically, I'm not sure. Um, but they're starting to see and then looking at what the long-term impacts are. Um, I was telling Jill right before the, the thing, we had at our facility, we had actually a West Nile virus survivor. Um, she was a, she's a resident in Winters. Um, she had West Nile virus. She was in the hospital. She was in a coma for two weeks. Um, she came out of it. Um, and you, if you're looking at her, she looks normal. She doesn't look like she's sick or ill or anything like that. But she was bitten 11 years ago, was in the hospital, had neuro invasive form of the disease and last year she had her shoulder replaced because her nerve endings um are not functioning properly. So she tore a tendon in her shoulder and she didn't even know it because her body's not telling her <laughs> wow. that something is hurting. And so people think that, that okay, well, once you've recovered, then you're okay. Well, she's still exhibiting symptoms um, and impacts from West Nile virus 11 years afterwards. Her vision is not quite as good as it, as it, as it was. So things, she says, when she looks at a piece of paper, um, the, the lines move on her. Um, and so again, these are impacts that, that looking at her you wouldn't necessarily see. So to answer your quick question, yes, if your body tends to build up that antibody, then, then it knows how to fight it off if you were to get reinfected with it. That was a long answer to get to that. Also, I had, um, so I use DEET products, but it seems, um, how, how safe is DEET? Because it takes off my fingernail polish. <laughs> I mean, 
Well, your uh, mosquitoes aren't going to bite your fingernails, um, <laughs> which but, is great. Uh, uh, no, there's been a number of studies on on DEET, and the impacts are, um, yeah, you know, I think people have a concern anytime that they're dealing with a chemical, um, and and we can appreciate that. And so there are some other options that are out there and available. But there have been a number of studies associated with DEET um, that that shows that um, you know the impacts are very minimal, or, or or you know that shouldn't really have too much. Obviously, you don't want to necessarily use high levels of DEET, especially on children. Um, so you want to use probably Probably one of those other products but you want to make sure you're following the directions a lot of people especially like what we see with with bug spray or or anything else um, uh, it's a judicious use of these products you know some people think well one spray is good well what do people do with a can of raid you know they see cockroaches and they just they spray half the can out there well that's not that's not what you need and so unfortunately it's trying to get people to make sure that they're reading the directions you know these products are labeled by uh, registered by EPA labeled by EPA specifically with um, those types of risks in mind. So if you follow the label directions, you shouldn't have too many impacts associated with it. Thank you. Aside from your from your Freedom. from your lovely nails. <laughs> Myself, Mike, here. Um, just a couple of questions. The first one is, um, as you say, that I mean, this year we're we're blessed, if you will, with with rain. This is this is very similar hydraulically or hydrologically, I think, to 1983, where it just kind of rained every other day for, right. <laughs> for the year. Um, but nonetheless, um, as we get into spring, temperatures are starting to get warmer. When do the mosquitoes, when, when is the kind of the trigger for activity for these guys? Well, we have mosquito production year round um, because we don't really have a hard freeze. We haven't had a hard freeze in a number of years. So that tends to suppress some of the numbers as with all insects. Um, so, uh, but typically once we start to get into the 80s is when you'll start to see more proliferation of the mosquito population. And so uh, mosquitoes in the, in the height of summer, in the water, um, they, will they will start to go from egg to adult in about a week. Um, and so that will start sometime about in May. So we're starting, I mean, that we've got this rain coming and then I think Thursday and Friday is supposed to be 80 degrees so that's definitely a number that we're watching so we start to see um, in our graphs kind of April starts to tick up a little bit May a little bit more and then our peak is really June July August and September which are the hottest parts of the year where we'll start to see the most mosquito production from that perspective yeah and virus activity follows that same trend so we'll start to pick up a little bit of virus activity in both birds and the mosquito population uh, possibly at the end of May or beginning part of June and then it ramps up and July, August, and September are very heavy virus activity months. Okay, and, and the second question I have is, um, you you listed malaria as as a uh, illness or a sickness borne by the mosquitoes, but we don't really kind of talk about that here in the United States. And I, having spent a portion of my life in Southeast Asia in the jungle areas where we took malaria pills every day. Uh, we don't deal with it here or we don't have the mosquitoes that carry it here or well, why we, are we yeah kind of we, exempt we, from that we do have we do have the mosquitoes that, that transmit malaria here in Sacramento and in fact we get about a dozen or so anywhere from about 10 to 20 cases of malaria uh, reported to us in uh, from the health department because it's a reportable disease now typically what happens is those people have traveled from an area that uh, endemic for malaria. They got sick there, they got bitten there, they come back here, now they exhibit symptoms and it gets diagnosed as malaria. And so we get notified and then what our staff does is we go around that particular area and we trap for the particular species of mosquitoes that will transmit malaria. Um, and so uh, that tends to not be, that, that particular mosquito tends, its population tends not to be until the end of summer. Um, so, but we have found, we have found, we've been, we found the right mosquito Mosquito, but we've tested that mosquito and haven't found it to be carrying malaria. So what would have to happen is that individual person would have to be sick and then that mosquito would have to bite that person and then pick it up and then conceivably bite someone else. And so if you don't have widespread malaria like you do in um, other parts of the world where every other person, that's an extreme, but a significant number of people have malaria and then you have a lot of those mosquitoes, then you have that local transmission. Uh, so we're, we're not quite at that layer, but it is think, something that, that, that is a concern um, and similar to the issues with dengue and chikungunya and Zika with these new invasive mosquitoes, that possibility exists. So we're monitoring that when we get those cases, but we get about anywhere from 10 to 20 malaria cases, travel-related cases, coming back to the to to our area, Sacramento and Yolo County. 
one last question, uh, and that is when you're treating the rice fields and uh, and you're you're using uh, mosquito fish. I mean, do you have to distribute those things throughout, or airdrop them? However, how do you get them in place? Do they naturally just migrate through all the the rice? Uh, uh, yes, and, and honestly, um, big areas like that are a bit of a challenge. Um, we tried a trial a few years ago, air dropping fish that, that didn't work very well. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, so we tend to what we do is, is we if we have a rice field like this, and they could be 100 acres or something like that, then we tend to drive around the particular area and plant them at different spots within the field, um, so that they can proliferate and 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 they'll breed and 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 uh, grow in abundance. Um, the challenge that we have with rice fields is that early on in the rice season, the farmers tend to do a lot of herbicides, mm -hmm. and so if we plant fish now, which would be a great well, not now, but let's say when when it's wide open water, right when they first flood it, that'd be a perfect time for us to plant mosquito fish because they would have an easier way to get all throughout the field. Uh, but then they put the herbicides out there and it kills the fish. So we have to wait until they're done with that before we can plant the fish. And then you've got the rice stalk already coming through through the water and it becomes a little bit harder for us to deal. But but again, that's why we plant so many fish um, in those areas. But yeah, we, we'll, they'll tend to, uh, they'll breed and and, uh, and every time, a lot of times if a, if a rice field has fish in it when we dip um, and maybe next year next year I'll bring a dipper or show you a little bit different but uh, it's like a little um, cup uh, on the end of a stick and you kind of dip a thing of water to try to see if there's larvae in there and a lot of times we'll dip fish so you pick up a fish you go okay I think we're good here um, but yeah we, it's it's definitely a challenge to try to get you know what happens here in the middle we've planted fish all around the ends but what's in the middle of the field well we can't even get there so we don't know so we're actually starting to use um, uh, uh, drone technology. Uh, we have a drone um, uh, currently now to do surveillance, um, to look for bad pools, or I'm sorry, to look for, for standing water, to look for, for other things in particular areas. And we're actually, we, last year we did a trial uh, with a company where we tried to land it on the water, and then it has a camera attached underneath to see if, if we could see mosquito larvae in the water itself. So um, we did a few trials with that last year. Some, some We need to tweak it. So it's, it's new technology, but it's something that we're trying to evolve in because it's you know I'm standing here in the corner I don't know what's going on in the middle of the field and I want to know what's going on in the middle of the field terrific well thank you very much yeah absolutely we have Dana uh, uh, with a mosquito bite is there an indicator um, a visual indicator that that um, bite or that that mosquito um, carries some virus is there any visual no. that no yeah, it's unfortunate. Like for Lyme disease, right? You get the bullseye. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's no there's no bullseye with this one. So um, you know, the telling what we try to tell people is that if you know you've been bitten by a mosquito in the summertime, which is when the, the mosquitoes and both virus activity are going to be at its highest, is in the summertime, and you start to experience symptoms, then go to your doctor and ask for the test. Um, the unfortunate, the only unfortunate part with knowing that you have West Nile is that there is no vaccine. Now they're working on one, um, Zika and West Nile. Um, they're working on a Zika vaccine at the moment, um, and they think that they're they're close to also potential vaccine for West Nile um, because they're similarly related. Um, how all that works, that's that's beyond me. But um, I know they're working on a vaccine. But yeah, unfortunately, not like Lyme disease where you see the bullseye. There isn't something that says, "Oh, I just got bitten by a West Nile mosquito." That would okay. be nice if they did it, like a W or something like that. <laughs> on there, but not yet. Um, one other quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think last time you mentioned um, the the bands, the mosquito repellent bands, and that they aren't that effective. Is that still what we're? Finding? Yeah, I, okay. I, I, uh, I I wouldn't use those. I wouldn't waste your money on that. Okay, because um, that I remember the citronella was you were saying was is the smoke that like from the it's citronella the smoke. Candles. It's not the yeah. It's it's not the okay. citronella in and of itself. I mean, if you if you bathed in the stuff, then yeah. I mean, but mosquitoes are picking up a scent for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, those bands have been tested. What they they do they put the band on on somebody and they literally stick their arm in a cage of mosquitoes and the mosquitoes still land and bite on it so uh, but when you put on a repellent specifically DEET um, or some of these other ones that are approved you put your you put that DEET on you put your hand in there and the mosquitoes don't land on you so it is truly a repellent but those okay. those bands are um, yeah I would I would spend your money somewhere else okay and, the, and then the DEET does need to cover the skin yes it's not just a yeah it's a total application okay. yeah yep. all right thank you Mark you have a question Thank you again, as usual, extremely informative. A couple of quick questions. One of your slides mentioned that in 2016 there were 442 cases of, was it, I guess it was West Nile, in California. How many in this district? 
your district? Uh, we had, last year we had 25 in Sacramento County and we had, I believe, 18 in Yolo County. Um, so we had about 43, about 10% of those cases. So uh, significantly greater percentage of the cases than we are percentage of the population. Correct, yeah, absolutely. So we absolutely. really need to be more careful here than most other places. Yes, yes. Last year for us, in terms of the mosquito population, was one of our highest virus activity years um, and uh, and so yeah uh, the year before we had less cases I think we had 12 cases in Sacramento County um, and so last year was our highest number of human cases within our district that we've had since about 2006 so yeah it was definitely a very bad year for us so what I hear you saying though is that every one of us living around here needs to be very aware of what you're saying and pay attention because it's not just a scratch that we got itch it's way more than that potentially absolutely absolutely is there any sort of age um, sensitivity to West Nile or younger folks or older folks um, more susceptible uh, o older and, and younger obviously if your immune system is a bit compromised or not quite fully developed you're going to be a little bit more susceptible and that your body's not going to want to be able to fight it off as as um, uh, as quickly uh, but there really is no rhyme or reason I mean I think it tends to be you look at, at, at the older population that tends to s exhibit symptoms more frequently um, and then of course again like the, the link to the diabetes and those types of things to where you're starting to see those symptoms uh, but I gave a presentation actually in this right here uh, last week to the Board of Supervisors um, and afterwards I had a gentleman stop me and his his daughter was a nine-year-old that um, that was in the hospital um, for months uh, and uh, was bitten by by a mosquito and so you know she exhibited symptoms but we've had we've had the wide range of things but it tends to be um, you know older um, so over over 50 uh, which isn't old but over 50 tends to be some that and that's probably just attributable to the fact that you know you've, you've fought off a lot of things in your lifetime and your in your system isn't quite as strong as as, a, as it would be for say a 20 year old mm -hmm. yeah, one of the things um, I don't recall we've talked about before but I was exposed to it a few years ago and I think it was after one of your talks um, you said something about reporting dead birds Yes. And I thought, no, oh, this is silly. So I called 911 when I saw a dead bird, and it, it wasn't silly. They were real serious, and they were all over it. Is that still the practice and policies? Absolutely. We, uh, we monitor the bird population um, uh, in general. We want to know those reports. So um, you can, uh, the, the number is 877-WNV-BIRD. Uh, um, it's actually run by the California Department of Public Health. Um, so it's run by the state, but they send that information to us, and we're the ones that come pick up the bird, and we'll test it. Um, next year, Maybe I'll bring some information on that because um, uh, we've gone a wide range. In fact, we don't really care what state the bird is in. Um, we, we've tested, uh, so typically it was, there needed to be kind of a, a fresh bird, a, a newly killed bird, um, but that's not true anymore. We can test the maggots, we can actually do a brain, um, uh, we take a syringe and go through the eye socket and take some tissue from the brain, uh, but we can even scrape a very desiccated bird and still pick up virus from it. So uh, we've a, 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 um, enhanced our techniques, I guess, to be able to try to do that. But yes, we want to know those birds because that's the first indicator of virus activity in a particular area. And specifically with the birds that we're talking about, crows, jays, magpies, very susceptible to West Nile. So once they get bitten, they tend to die within just a few days. And so as, if you see like in July or August, and, you, and crows are smart, and you see a crew, crow kind of hopping around and looks goofy, um, call us. Um, because even if it hasn't died yet, that's probably a bird that ain't going to make it. Because crows are, crows are crafty. And if you see one staggering, it looks like it's drunk. It's... I don't know, it's, it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny, but um, it looks like it's drunk. Um, it's probably one that is suffering the effects of West Nile. So we definitely want to know about that. You can call the district, um, and we'll get you the number. You can also go online to westnile.ca.gov and report that bird. We get the report, we go pick it up, we'll <coughs> test it, and then we'll typically call you and let you know if that bird tested positive or not. So basically, from all of us, for our own individual perspectives, if anybody out there saw a dead bird in the neighborhood, it benefits them to call in because those mosquitoes may be floating around their house. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Eric, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, just one real quick question. Let's, uh, I'm, I'm imagining a scenario where I'm walking down the street and I have my long sleeves on and everything, and I notice that there's like a, like a standing pool of water in somebody else's 
property. Do you have any suggestions on how to handle that? I don't want to go knock on their door. And is there just what would you suggest? Is call us. We'll we'll take care of it. Absolutely, okay. uh, we do that on. And you can you can submit service requests on our website okay. um, anonymously. Just all you have to do is give us the address. We'll take it from there. So uh, we have authority under the California Health and Safety Code to go onto private property. But we will always work with the landowner. We'll knock on the door. We'll talk with them. We'll say, hey, look, we just want to go in there and check it out. And 99 percent of the people are happy for us to do that. And you get 1% that don't like us, and then we, we can escalate the, the aspect from there. But if you see a problem, all you have to do is call us. We'll be out there the very next day. Oh, thank you. Yep. And one more question. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the excellent presentation. It gets better every year. In fact, you should give it to our local medical schools, uh, our yeah. medical society. It's that quality. But um, let's see. Oh, so regarding the DEET, yeah, there is uh, a question about DEET. Margie was. Um, the Ultrathon product, which is, I think, formulated for the Army, and right. yeah, it's like 30%, but it's in a special base that doesn't absorb through your skin as much, and, and it lasts probably 12 hours, or, or yeah. at least, yeah. yeah. And that's probably the, one of the better products. But w if you have a um, water source that's more than four miles from an urban area, like a rural area, do you bother with that, too? Absol then? Absolutely. Mosquitoes can fly. We have some mosquitoes that, that don't fly very far. We have some mosquitoes that fly quite a, quite a ways. And so we want to make sure that we're protecting everyone. So yeah, absolutely. You know, we do a lot of work in the rice fields and wetlands and things like that, which is far enough away from the population because we yeah. recognize that they're going to fly. And it's not just all in one night, but within a couple days, they come across those blood meals and they have a possibility of coming into town. Because if you think about it, if you're an insect, right? When you, when you uh, uh, turn on your, your porch light at night, you see all those insects flying around the light. Um, so mos mosquitoes are attracted to light as well. And so if you were born out in the, I say born, when you're born out in the rice field and you emerge and you're looking around and you see a series of lights out in the distance, where are you going to go? I'm going that direction. So, um, so yeah, we want to know about whatever it is and, and we monitor that on a regular basis. Again, if you go back to, you know, the map where we have our district and the zones that are set up, some of those are just, they're just flat out rural zones, but we're monitoring the populations out there as well, because it can have an impact on, on the people that, that live in there and the people that, uh, that live uh, in the major population centers. Thank you. Mark? I, I'm sorry, Tony, I had just one more question. That was the type of repellent that you just mentioned because I, I didn't understand exactly what you oh, said. It's made by 3M. Can you turn it on? Yeah. Oh, I don't want to be advertising a product, but it is 3M brand Ultrathon. It's a cream. Yeah, it's probably rated as one of the highest product, highest um, efficacies. Okay. Dana, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I just can you clarify the risks for women of childbearing age and the time frame, and you know how long they need to be concerned after being exposed and. Well, the, the, the risk associated with, with um, childbearing age is really for Zika. So for West Nile, you're going to have those symptoms. But for Zika, yes, absolutely. Uh, if you, um, there are, uh, on the CDC website, uh, there's a map of, um, of endemic areas for Zika. Specifically, you're looking at uh, parts of Mexico, uh, Central America, South America, um, Brazil, obviously, specifically. Um, and if you are thinking about having a child, um, you want to wait six months after you visited any one of those areas. That's the recommendation from CDC, is to wait six months. And even for the males that are going there, you want to use protection because it can be transmitted sexually during that time as well. So, um, so they're, they're giving a recommendation of six months um, from visiting an endemic area before considering having a child. And if you're pregnant, um, you may want to seriously, and they have travel recommendations to where they say, see if you can change your, your travel plans until, uh, until you've had the, the pregnancy. Because if you, get, if you get infected in that first trimester, as they're saying, is the most severe um, uh, birth defects or, or, or neurological problems that you can have, which would make the most sense. You have the most exposure or the longer term exposure um, uh, for, uh, for the process there. So, um, so, but it still tends to, have, they still are showing impacts, again, neurological impacts from third trimester pregnancies um, of being infected with Zika. So if you're pregnant, avoid those areas. If you can't avoid those areas, make sure you're taking all the appropriate precautions with repellent, long sleeves, everything you can do to avoid being bitten by mosquitoes. Um, but if you're not pregnant and you're thinking about it, you may want to, you know, just make sure that that's in your mind uh, of waiting about six months or so. Okay. 
Great, which thank is you very much. Great presentation. Yeah, Marjorie, did you have another question? I did. Um, so when you go to people's houses, do you wear special uniforms, or how do you identify yourself as from the Mosquito Vector Control? Yeah, absolutely. We, we have uniforms. Our trucks have logos on them. Um, uh, they have business cards, everything else that would say, you know, Mosquito Control District. And uh, But yeah, we have uh, we have uniforms on with uh, with our logo, and, and, uh, and we can be identified in that fashion, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Gary, thank you very much. A absolutely. We appreciate you coming here and speaking No, no to problem. Us. We'll see you next April, hopefully. I'll, I'll, <laughs> and I'll try to bring some stuff on the dead birds. I'll change it up a little bit next year. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you thank very you. much. Have a great day. <laughs> Nobody else is here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, going on to uh, item number seven is approval of our March uh, 2017 meeting minutes. Uh, I believe they're in your... Uh, package. Uh, please review them, and if there's a motion we to approve, I'd like to hear it, please. I'll move to uh, approve the minutes. Okay, there's a motion. I'll, I'll second it. Okay, good. So there's a motion to approve the second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, good, thank you. Uh, the next item, a review of our March meeting action items. Uh, the first one here is our Folsom Dam tour request has been declined for security reasons. Obviously it's because I, I think, Jill, you explained it was because of the water issue at this time of year. Uh, that they Correct, were their issue. wording was when water is touching the dam, it's high risk and they don't do tours. Okay, so maybe uh, later in the summer we can go back and ask them at some point in time if there's an opportunity then it, once the water levels go back to normal levels or something like okay. that. Okay, yes I will. Okay, good. Uh, secondly, uh, our Arch Nexus building tour is now scheduled for May 18th. I'm glad I looked at that because I had it scheduled on my calendar for tomorrow, so uh, May sounds better. And it's from uh, 12 noon to 1.30, so hopefully all the commissioners will be able to attend that. Um, we were going to create an ad hoc electric vehicle co committee, and right now Eric, uh, Mark, Dana, and myself have volunteered to participate on that. We've already begun to discuss the contents of the report. We'll be able to discuss that a little bit later tonight, briefly. And finally, number four here was meet and greet uh, Supervisor Susan Frost on the 12th, and, and that was done with myself, Mark, and Marjorie. And I thought it was a, a very good meeting. Uh, we, uh, it was a very positive reception from uh, uh, Su Susan Foss and Mark Hedges, her chief of staff. And I thought we had a very good discussion. Uh, is there any thoughts from you, Mark or Marjorie, you'd like to add to that? It wasn't May 12th then. I thought the meeting went really well. And I, I think um, that's the first time we I've visited with somebody that I've actually represented on the Sacramento Environmental Commission, and I think her feedback um, to us was very positive. I think we, it w it's a good relationship to be in touch with all the agencies. Yeah. Uh, Margie said it all, nothing to add. I'm sorry? Margie said everything that needed to be said, so. What I'd like to do is, is follow it up with a letter to her, thanking her for her time and maybe posing any questions we have that we're, we can offer our assistance to her and her efforts and her agendas and things like that. And secondly, I think the information that we laid out in our presentation may be applicable to other meetings with uh, representatives, both with Elk Grove and the city of Sacramento later on. Dan. Um, two things, first of all, who did you meet, it says May 12th? It was April 12th. Oh, all right, April 12th. Okay, thank you. And then, so you met with Susan for, okay. And then um, with regard to the mayor, I'm waiting for them to get some times back to me. His schedule obviously is more impacted, so I called the mayor's office and um, they're working on dates. Okay, good. And also, I know Eric is working with the city of El Grove to uh, set up a meeting yes. also what would you like me to propose some dates and then go from there or would do you want how would you like I, me I'm pretty it? flexible so okay. why don't you propose some dates that may be agreeable to you and them and, okay. I, and I'll try to accommodate that <clears throat> sounds good okay 
Um, the items we have on the second page of our agenda, items 9 through 12, are really kind of an outline of how I'd like to see our future meetings be conducted. So uh, where we have, let's say under item 9, we have create permanent committees, uh, committees. I would like these permanent committees to be able to report to the entire commission their activities and progress of, on a monthly basis. So for tonight, I would like to have all of us think about which committees we may want to volunteer for. And so by next meeting in um, May, uh, we'll be able to staff up these three committees, the Environmental Awards Committee for 2017, the Web Page Committee, and then the 2017 Annual Reports Committee. So if you all give that some consideration, then uh, we can make some decisions next month on that. Uh, on item 10, the Cyanobacteria Committee, um, we have drafted a draft report and it's been reviewed by the members of the subcommittee and we've just received comments as early as late as today. And we're going to be uh, incorporating those comments and meeting for a, a second time to come to an agreement on the conclusions and recommendations that we would like to make on this report before we bring it back to our full commission. So ideally, we might be able to bring it back next month to the commission for consideration. And I would like to think that if it is acceptable to the entire commission, then we would carry it forward to the State Water Board for their thoughts before we carried it before any of the uh, agencies with authority over us. Because they have a technical insight that they mm -hmm. may be able to provide to us. So if that's a reasonable uh, strategy, then I think we should just I proceed so. on that. Yeah. Okay. And on, on, on the subject of that report, uh, unfortunately, I'm a little slow here, but it seemed to me I wish Gary were still here because he's dealing with the water and places with water and stagnant water, and that's the same kind of what we're looking at for the cyanobacteria. Maybe we can combine an outreach effort with the vector control folks. Um, that makes a lot of sense. As a as a combination effort here, just a, it was just a yeah. thought that just dawned on me in a moment. Not while Gary was here, unfortunately. So I don't know what kind of outreach they do, but it would seem to me that we might be able to piggyback with. Why don't them. we Why don't we make a contact to Gary and at least pose that as a, a question to see yeah. if uh, if that's something. Would you like me to do that, or so um, you want to do that, or Joel, or let's think about that. Let's figure out how how is the best way to do that. Okay. I saw the, I just can't think off the top of my head here. To you got it. That's fine. Uh, Okay. Yeah, just it was just a thought here at the uh, spur of the moment. No, it's, it's a great, it's a great idea. I, I, and they already have the staff who are out there monitoring these things. They, exactly. You know, so. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It would seem like there's there's some synergy. Some yes, definitely synergy there between us, the two. Yeah. That's an excellent idea. Uh, the other uh, ad hoc committee is electric electric fleet committee that we've just recently formed. Um, we have some. Uh, Topics that we are bantering about among the committee, and we are starting to collect uh, background information that's relevant to addressing those topics. And uh, so I think what we'll be doing over the next couple of weeks is further clarifying the, the nature of the topics that we want to go further with and come back to the commission maybe at the next meeting and reveal to our thoughts on how we want to carry this forward and, and leading to a, another recommendation on the status of uh, zero emission vehicles for the county and the city. Any comments or thoughts on that? Okay. Um, let's jump to item number 12 then, uh, our agency monitoring report back. Is there any news from any of the commissions regarding um, agencies that they've been monitoring over the past month? Uh, yes, I've talked to the county and found some inter interesting information all very preliminary at this point but believe it or not the county's in conversation with a firm in phoenix uh, and very early conversation so this may or may not happen it may not happen soon but they're pretty serious about starting to try out electric collection vehicles which if they can do electric collection vehicles the climate impacts the fuel impacts and all that are, are significant um, obviously it depends to the same extent as 
my wife's view of electric vehicles, which is range anxiety to the extreme. Loaded up with a bunch of garbage and can't get back home, it's a big deal. Uh, so they're really having to look at all features, all factors, costs, how we do the charging systems, the whole deal. But this is the only place in the country being done. And so we're, we're not, Chicago tried it several years ago and it failed there. But this is the first try with some advanced vehicles and it looks like something that Sac County may be the first in this country to look at and test in a real direct use environment. It'll be interesting and more to come when it happens. Yeah, could you uh, track that, Mark, and, and keep us informed of the status of the testing and uh, when it is going to be occurring? And Absolutely, and in fact, I uh, may suggest that the county's staff member who is responsible for the program, after they get it going well, come back and brief us on what they've learned because <laughs> this, they, they'll do a job on this. They really will. They'll take this whole deal apart. When they come back, they'll know everything they need to know about these things. Yeah, excellent. Any other commissioners have any other items to report? Um, Sherry, I've been following the Lower American River Conservancy. Um, you know, there was a, a bill that passed. So unfortunately right now, I, I discovered there's no funding for it. And so they're waiting for funding. And there, there is funding written into this um, AB 18, which is a large parks bond, which just passed the assembly. It's in the Senate. It's 3.1 billion uh, for parks. And so if that passes, well, actually, that would just, if it gets signed by the, passes the Senate, gets signed by the governor, it will go on the ballot in June 2018. And then if it passes, it will, there's a long struggle here, it will then, it, it will fund the Lower American River Conservancy. That's, that's the current plan. So it's kind of on hold right now. Yes, right. So it's a, it's a ways out before yeah. there's going to be any funding. Oh, the other uh, agency I'm following is County Public Health. And um, we had an excellent presentation by one of the EMD uh, folks last last meeting, um, Jason from Calaveras County, and uh, he talked to us about the uh, environmental impact of, of marijuana cultivation. And so that would be actually uh, something we could consider for a presentation to our committee. Yeah. The environmental impact of marijuana cultivation. Okay, something we can put on our yeah put in our topics list. Yes. Okay. Very good. Mark? Uh, just real quick, it's not quite on my um, commission or my monitoring list yet, but if you guys saw the Senate Bill 1 was signed by the governor a couple weeks ago, and so we're going to be getting a lot more funding um, in SACOG region to fix our local roads. So I'll, I should be having more to report in the future. Good. Okay. Uh, any other comments or thoughts? Okay. Uh, going to item number 13 will be our environmental management director's report. Marie, would you like to give us some Sure. Idea? So I want to report that Sacramento County Environmental Management Department is celebrating the 10th year anniversary of putting food safety first with its green, yellow, and red placarding program. These yellow, oh, these green, yellow, and red placards are based on the number of violations observed during the inspection that can cause or contribute to foodborne illness. The colored placards are placed in front of the food establishments after their inspection. Other contributing enhancements include their, uh, the mandatory food safety school, which is taught in seven different languages, as well as a DVD that is offered called How to Get a Green. Inspection results are also available at any time on EMDs or the Environmental Management uh, Department's website and through its SAC Food mobile app. As a result of these efforts, causes of salmonellaosis and campylobacteriosis are lower than statewide average, and over the last 10 years, there has been a decline in observed major food violations. The green, yellow, and red placard program has made a positive impact on the retail food industry and its customers in Sacramento County. So we're very proud of that 10-year marker. We were one of the first counties to do the green, yellow, red, and, and sub subsequently, I think there's nine counties that have followed us and have adopted that type of signage. Yeah, and I think from the public's perspective, there's a lot of appreciation for the placards because it's such an easy system to mm -hmm. understand. You know. And then we uh, carried that over to the, uh, the food vendors, the trucks. Yes. Uh -huh. So they started placarding those also. Mark? Just, just wanted to ask Marie, how many other states also have a food, pack, food placard program? On the states, 
Well, I know, I think Canada, it's not a state, but it's a country, they, I think part of their provinces also do that. And I think, Jill, is it, it's eight? Hawaii. Hawaii? Oh, it was, it's just Hawaii that adopted it. Fabulous. So California's leading in simplicity. How's that? Okay, Mary, does that, that conclude your report? Yes, that concludes my report. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, before we go on to final commissioner comments, I guess I wanted to just jump back onto item 12 again and, and maybe ask the commissioners for our next meeting, be prepared to identify any other stakeholders or agencies that we want to begin uh, considering for future outreach uh, beyond our immediate um, authorizing agencies, if there's any groups out there like uh, American River Foundation or uh, other uh, interested parties that may be willing to want to talk to us or uh, uh, have us re uh, be considering their issues of concern, I think we should better start identifying those now and uh, put them on our calendars too. So, um, uh, Richard, um, excuse sure, me. You know, when the uh, Sacramento Metro Chamber does their cap to cap, they have an environmental committee. We may want to interact with that committee to uh, see what their issues are, to see if we have some input when they go to Washington. We might want to add something to some of the papers that they're presenting. What is their schedule for going back to Washington? It's May 1st through the 3rd. So it's, it's, it's coming it's immediately up quickly, coming up. yeah. Because I remember last year we missed the, the trip and we didn't take any real actions to engage them. So we need to time it so that at least we can participate before they go back there. Or, you know, at least we'll hear back from when they, when they return. So we can maybe monitor that. That'd, That'd be, be good. great. Good. Do, do, Margie, do you know, do, is there any sort of a, I don't know, synopsis report compiled by the cap to cap, at the end of the, of the, the period that uh, kind of puts it all together and what they achieved or did not achieve, who they met with? You know, they have issue papers that before they leave, they have, before they have, go. Before but, they but go is there but any kind of like summary of the results of our meetings with whoever they met with? <clears throat> Are you from, uh, do you know if they, you know, they I don't prepare know. any sort of a, whatever you want to call it, after action report kind of a thing? You know, I'm a co-chair of, of the Transportation Committee, and we, I don't think I prepared anything or helped prepare anything, so I'm not sure, but I'll ask them. Okay. Because if they do, then that's something they should come here to report to us, maybe. Okay. Are there any other comments by commissioners you'd like to bring up or discuss? Hearing none, I guess we will adjourn the meeting till May 22nd, where we'll have our meeting at the EMD offices at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thanks a lot.